we've we've had uh, we have a new uh, antenna product, uh, a, a diversity omni antenna, and so all of a sudden we're getting lots and lots and lots of questions about antennas and antenna placement and that kind of thing. So we thought uh, it'd be a good time to uh, provide a little webinar and talk about that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the rules for in-ear monitor antennas and wireless microphone receiver antennas are basically the same thing, except you know you're going in two different directions, but the uh, the same principles apply. So um, the first thing we want to talk about when we talk about antennas is the best practices. Let's don't let's don't do the dumb things that uh, are going to cause us grief right from the get go. So number one most important thing is that you have a line of sight. Uh, if your transmitter, be it a microphone or an in-ear transmitter antenna, uh, can't see uh, the receiver, um, you are going to have a lot of problems. Uh, you, have, you have given up uh, a substantial amount of your reliability uh, for free. So if your antennas are inside a rack or inside a closet or in the next room, um, it may work for you. I won't say it can't work, but you are really giving up a lot of potential on the reliability. So, um, yeah, just uh, you know, uh, make sure you've got a straight line of sight uh, above people's heads. Usually, is the problem. Uh, uh, but like I said, it could be mounted in a funny, a funny place behind a wall or something. Um, not good. Oop, we went to. Um, there is a minimum distance that you need to be from an antenna. And uh, this is very similar to as if we're speaking, right? I'm speaking to you now, but if I got up and spoke with this voice an eighth of an inch away from your ear, I'd be screaming at you. In the case of a radio, you would likely be overloading the front end, uh, which is not a good thing, obviously. So uh, this, this these distances that I'm showing here assume a 10 milliwatt transmitter. Obviously, if you have a much more powerful transmitter, uh, these numbers need to be different. But, uh, and you see they're different for the relative uh, gain strength of different types of antennas, right? So um, this is something you just want to, to, to uh, be aware of. Um, you know where I see this sometimes that people don't think about is uh, uh, for people that are using uh, 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 transmitters on their guitars. They may have a they may have several transmitters on several guitars, and it's sitting right next to their rack, right? <laughs> so they don't realize that I mean that that transmitter is right on top of that antenna, and that's uh, that's something that you need to be aware of because it's going to cause you grief. Likewise, by putting your antenna up in the air, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to get very close to an antenna that's up in the air with a handheld microphone. You know, you'd have to hold your hand up and, and intentionally do that. Um, so don't do that, right? That's pretty easy. Um, another thing with respect to antennas uh, are these antenna farms. And uh, this is something you definitely don't want to do. Uh, you are giving away a whole bunch of reliability when you do this. You are cutting range, you're cutting reliability. In the case of analog stuff, you may be cutting sound quality as well. So immediately, the first thing that's wrong is that, uh, so you got a radio wave traveling through air. It, it penetrates your antenna and creates a current in that, uh, in that antenna. And that current moving through a conductor uh, creates uh, magnetism. And then, of course, you have the same problem going backwards. A magnetic field cutting through a, uh, a, excuse me, a conductor, according to Maxwell's law, creates a current. So what you're doing is each antenna is sticking another signal into the antenna that's right next to it. Now, the strength dies with distance, of course. But when you're only two inches away, you're screaming in its ear again. So. Uh, if you've got to have an antenna farm like this, truly, if you could space all those antennas six feet apart, um, we'd be having a different discussion, but how you're going to put 
you know, 20 antennas six feet apart <laughs> is going to, it's going to take a really big desk. So um, you, you, you want to eliminate, you always want to use the fewest antennas that you can use. And uh, for, for wireless mics in a single room, that usually is going to be one pair of antennas, one diversity pair of antennas. And it may be one uh, uh, antenna for your in-ear monitors, although there's a, there is a difference there. We'll talk about that. Um, the second thing is when you put a bunch of antennas together, you create an array, right? So like when you put speakers together and you create a line array, when you have antennas together, you get unpredictable pickup pattern. Well, they're very predictable if you engineer it out. I mean, that's how, that's how paddle antennas are made. Uh, there are uh, multiple elements, but they're very carefully aimed and calculated with their lengths to combine to create something that you want. Much in the same way with speakers, if you stack them a certain way, you get a line array. Uh, if you stack them all over the place, you get what you get all over the place. And so ultimately what you end up with on your stage is, is hot spots and cold spots. So if you look at that horrible design there on the right, um, you know, that's, that's based on just two antennas uh, being very close together. So when you have 20 antennas, like who knows what it's gonna be. And that's the problem. There's no way to know what you're gonna get. So uh, that, that's another reason you wanna avoid these antenna farms. And then the third reason is you can't get, you can't set your antennas to get proper polarization. So, you know, so polarization is simply that, that your transmitting antenna needs to be lined up with your receiving antenna. And when it's not, as you can see by the different positions that the wireless microphone transmitter could be in, your antenna loses the ability to soak that power up out of the air. And so uh, there is a way to properly polarize your antennas but when you have these tiny little distances, you're never gonna be able to achieve it. So again, as, as you're walking back and forth across space, um, the ability of your antennas to, to receive a constant signal is, is changing. Uh, so let's get rid of the antenna farms. Um, I also wanna talk about uh, the most basic uh, placement for your antennas. And that's that they want to be six feet up off the deck or they want to be a couple feet off the wall. Now it's not always possible. Sometimes you have to mount on a wall. If you have, if you have a directional antenna, it's not nearly as bad, but what, what's happening is you're, um, you're getting lots and lots of echoes off the wall with an omnidirectional antenna. You don't ever want to put an omni up against the wall. Well, it doesn't stop working, but you greatly diminish what happens. Here's what happens. You get, you get multiple echoes off that wall, and it detunes the center frequency of whatever you're trying to transmit, right? So you can look and see on the right, uh, that's a bunch of different frequencies, but off the wall, and then when you put them up next to the wall, you can see the tuning instead of whatever you set, you know, 500.125 shifts a little bit. A few hertz it's not a bunch but it just makes it that much harder for your receiver that's tuned to that frequency you've set it at and now it's no longer quite tuned in so we want to avoid uh, uh, antennas uh, off the wall uh, off the ceiling off the floor unless they're specifically designed for that there are some that are but generally speaking your whips and your paddles and your are not going to take kindly you are giving up some performance if you put it too close to the wall. And again, six to 10 feet above the floor uh, gets it over people's heads. And again, we minimize the reflections. So actually antennas on mic stands with boom arm um, work very well. Another thing that people do is they mount antennas to truss without thinking about it. Um, so in this example, uh, on the bottom, all the RF venue CP beam antennas can be mounted directly up against truss or metal, any other kind of metal, uh, you know, 
if you want to mount it to a garage door, I guess you can. Um, but those antennas have a have a back plane. And so they don't pick up anything from behind them. So they will ignore the reflections uh, from the metal back into the antenna. But you see above, and this is the way to do it if you have to do it, um, there's an omnidirectional antenna and there's a paddle antenna. And they are above Well, am I back? Rob, is, I can see you, so I need a visual because yes, I'm not you are, you are back. You are back. You're back. I'm back. back. And I'm hearing nobody because nobody's talking. Well, isn't this exciting, you guys? That's that's one thing about living out in the sticks and having uh, and having crappy internet. That's what we got. <laughs> So thanks for uh, thanks for putting up with this. All right, let's try moving along here. Um, so this is a question I get all the time: is how far will my antennas go? How far will they reach? And the the quick answer is antennas don't reach; they catch what you throw at them. So it depends how hard you're throwing something, um, and really it it depends on how hard you're throwing, how much power, and it depends what your noise floor is. Because right now, if you had zero noise floor on the planet, your mics would work for a thousand miles. But there's a noise floor, and so you know when you're trying to when you're trying to uh, to overcome the noise, you have a limit. All right. So this is how we tell how far you can use a transmitter from an antenna. Uh, we've talked about this before. You you do what's called a link budget where you look at the power that gets to your receiver, uh, you, look at the, you look at the transmit power, and then you look at the gains and losses in between. And you gotta do some measurements and you gotta do some math. But I am here to show you and very happy to show you, if you haven't seen this already, this has been up for about two weeks. We now have on our website, uh, we call it the performance calculator. This will create a link budget for you. So if you want to know if your antenna is going to work to 100 feet or 50 feet or 200 feet, you, you simply um, just click on the drop, drop down boxes, okay? I don't need exact measurements. Um, and uh, so you just fill these in, tell it what you got, tell it what wire you're using, tell it how far apart things are. And you're going to end up with hopefully a green light at the bottom. If you end up with a green light at the bottom, that means you have more than 20 dB of carrier to noise ratio, and that should be good. Um, if you don't, you could get a yellow or a red light. Uh, I'm going to expect that I don't have to explain what, what those mean. Uh, so if you get those, um, you know, then you're going to have to rejigger some of your stuff here, make some changes. But anyway, this is, uh, this is on our webpage at rfvenue.com. And really, there's no reason that you shouldn't go look at this Look at your system that you've got now. Look at your system that you're planning on. Um, and this is going to give you a high reliability answer as to whether that stuff's going to work. So just head over to our website when we're done here uh, and click on this. We don't collect any information. We don't nothing. This is just, this is just to help people um, get the result they're looking for, right? Nobody's happy if this doesn't work. So anyway, that's, uh, that's new on our website. So let's, uh, let's talk about actually aiming antennas. Um, so the first thing we have to talk about is where do we want to aim the antenna? What do we want it to do? Do we want to use a directional antenna? Do we want to use an omnidirectional antenna? It depends what your job is, right? So if you had a dark room, uh, you would put a single light bulb in the center of the ceiling and that would illuminate the whole room. That would be what an omnidirectional antenna does where if you, uh, you know, were trying to find your keys out in the dark, um, you don't need to illuminate everything. Uh, you just need to be able to see what you're pointed towards. You don't really wanna see anything else. So that's the first thing, figure out what you want because you don't wanna pick up anything that you don't wanna pick up, right? You, let me put that a different way. You only wanna pick up your intended transmitters. If we could make a system that perfectly saw your microphone back to your antenna and saw nothing else, that would be great. 
but that's not possible. So you're going to get some other stuff. So, all right. So where's your antenna going to go? Um, see here, you can see uh, in this situation, I've got a directional antenna and an omnidirectional antenna. Um, the directional antenna at the back of the house is pointed toward the stage and that's what it's getting. Uh, the omnidirectional antenna is picking up in 360 degrees. So I guess we could move that omni to the center position of the auditorium, uh, but you're gonna have to put it six or eight feet high, you know, so people are not gonna be able to walk down the aisles. So it's just the wrong, it's the wrong antenna for this job. On the other hand, if you had a job that looked something like this, you were set up in a park and, you know, the car shows in one corner and the kiddie rides are in one corner and there's some entertainment or some speeches in another corner, then using an omnidirectional microphone from the center of that location is going to cover everything. Or if you used a directional antenna, it's only going to cover in the direction that, that you're pointing it, which won't be your entire field. So this is just a different job. So think about what you want to do. If you're just covering people on a stage or more or less doing that, then that's all you want to pick up because anything else you pick up is picking up noise floor, right? So if back to that other one, if we were pointed at the stage with the Omni, it's picking up everything behind us. That means it's picking up all the noise that's coming in the other direction where a directional antenna is somewhat immune to noise coming from its backside. Okay, so to figure out where your antenna actually goes, uh, we have to talk about polar patterns. Um, and so almost uh, every antenna has a spec that's gonna have a polar that looks something like this. If, uh, maybe you're used to seeing these with microphones and maybe not, but we have this polar uh, pattern that, um, so this is considering what we call boresight. So that's pointed straight ahead, right? So if your antenna is like you're looking through a gun sight, pointed straight ahead. So in the case of this polar pattern, uh, straight north is straight ahead for your antenna. And then we usually look out to the 3 dB down point, right? So you can see those concentric circles as they get smaller and smaller, it means your antenna is losing power. So generally, we look at what we call the 3 dB down point. That's where the, that's where the power of the antenna is half uh, of what it is straight forward. Uh, so you come up with your, your, your coverage when you're looking at aiming your antenna is somewhat like this. Although, um, and that's what we call the beam width uh, of the antenna. So this would be like a pad <clears throat> paddle antenna. Now, it's not... It's not completely dead behind it, but you can see the power is, is way reduced. So it has some pickup behind it, but not a whole lot of pickup behind it. So it's basically picking up in, the, in a forward direction. Of course, if we had an omni antenna, it would just be that whole circle. It picks up in 360 degrees. Um, how far, so I, I'm showing you this, this triangle, but I'm not intending or not implying that it stops at the end of that triangle. It just keeps going. How far it goes, you go back to that performance calculator and it's going to tell you if it's, well, it's not going to tell you it goes a thousand miles, but it's going to tell you, you know, for a reasonable distance what to expect. So, so the same antenna has different ranges depending on where you are, right? So if you're, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, if you're on top of a mountain in Idaho, you're going to get a different answer than if you're, uh, you know, in downtown Manhattan, even though the same, you know, the electronics don't change. All right, so the typical beam width of antennas kind of looks like this. Whip antennas pick up in a hor horizontal now, right? Because unless, unless your guy with a wireless microphone is, you know, 50 feet up in the air, uh, I've never done that job myself, but I suppose if somebody's parachuting in, we're gonna have to talk. Other than that, if, you're, if your transmitters are sitting on a stage or, you know, a predictable area, a whip antenna has, is an omnidirectional antenna, and it picks up in 360 degrees horizontally. A paddle antenna is about 120 degrees and picks up in front of it and rejects what's behind it. And a helical antenna, like you would use for in-ear monitors, 
picks up at a much tighter pattern, about 60 degrees. So it's easier to focus. It picks up less extraneous noise. And you can use that paddle, excuse me, you can use that helical antenna for your wireless microphones if you had to navigate around a particularly noisy thing. You know, if, the, if on the side wall of your auditorium there was an x-ray machine or something, uh, then maybe this helical would be a good choice in that situation because you wouldn't pick up the sides as much. But um, anyway, though, so these are your basic, your basic types. All right, so let's get down to how do we aim our antennas? So if we look at a, if we look at a room that looks somewhat like this, um, you can put that antenna, a paddle antenna probably would be your best choice. You could put it on the back wall and shoot it towards the stage. You could drop it down off uh, cross beams or something, put it in the middle of the, of the auditorium pointed towards the stage where you would uh, get a stronger signal because you're closer to the stage or you can mount it up closer to the stage. So you get, you get a stronger signal the closer you go. Um, it's inverse square law, just like speakers, right? Uh, every time you cut the distance in half, you cut the power uh, to a quarter, or you, excuse me, the other way around, you increase the, you increase the power four times. So having, having your antenna up close to your stage means you can turn down everything else, which takes care of a lot of other problems. Um, now, again, uh, that paddle antenna is mostly picking up in a forward direction, but there's a little bit of pickup in the back. So if you particularly needed to pick up these corners, reliably, they're going to be a little on the weak side. Depending on your noise floor, you may not get them at all, or they may work fine, but just realize that there's a much weaker signal available back there than there is, you know, if you're intending to be on a stage. Now, if you do need to cover the whole room, for example, you have performers that walk all the way off the stage, or you have a pastor that likes to walk all the way to the back of the hall, a better choice would be in a corner of the room. And that way you will get solid coverage throughout the whole floor, floor uh, area, right? We don't, have it, we don't have any weak spots this way. So generally speaking, I, I, it, always, it always occurs to people to put the antennas to be centered, you know, but um, actually paddle antennas usually work better in corners because th they will cover the entire space. You could also put this antenna uh, in the wing, and that would be fine. It's even closer, so you're going to get stronger signal, and that's a good thing. Um, so any any of those positions, you know, with the antenna pointed in the proper way. Now I'm talking just talking about one antenna. Uh, that assumes you're using a paddle like our diversity fin. If you are using a pair of paddles, you just have to mount two and keep them at least six feet apart. Um, you will have some other, you'll have some polarization crossfade issues you'll have to deal with using a pair of paddles, but that's a different story. That really doesn't have anything to do with aiming particularly. So you can substitute your pair of paddles for any of these that I've shown you. Now, if you're using mics and ears together, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, this is the worst possible example of what you could be doing because you have transmitting antennas right next to receiving antennas. So we're back to that screaming in somebody's ear, right? You've got one antenna that's pitching and one antenna that's catching. And when it's two inches apart, it's, <laughs> it's a real fastball coming, right? So, um, you know, you deal with this with microphones all the time. This is, this is something that you commonly use, but maybe you never thought about it with respect to antennas. And so, what happens uh, with your microphone and your speaker is you get feedback, right? If your speaker, which would be your transmitting antenna, is blasting directly into your receiving antenna, um, you would get, in audio, you would get feedback. That's not what happens with radio, but with radio, you just get uh, a whole bunch of interference. And so you need to be careful to not point your transmitting antennas at your receiving antennas. So how do we do that? Well, we could go back to the receiving antenna being on the back wall someplace and the transmitting antenna for your in-ears being in a wing. 
So now you've got a 90 degree angle. Um, and that's going to minimize the, the, the crosstalk of the two antennas. So that would be a good way to do it. You could also move your receiving antenna to the same wall so that your antennas are pointed in the same direction. Remember, they're directional, so they don't go sideways a lot, not, not when they're close by. You could see they, they do go sideways later on but they're farther away, so you're not getting as much, as much leakage that way. But of course, the absolute worst thing you could do would be to put your transmitting antenna on one side and your receiving antenna on one side. So if you're using a pair of paddles and you put one in each wing, then really the only, thing, the only option you have left would be to, to turn the in-ear monitor transmitting antenna uh, 90 degrees. So you, if you could move it out to the back wall of the house uh, and, and that way you would, you would minimize the overlap. Uh, and there you go. So same way, you can have both antennas on the back wall. Now a little tip, if you have both antennas on the same wall, uh, you can pick up a little extra performance for free, not a bunch, but it's free, uh, by moving the in-ear monitor antenna a bit closer to the stage, even a couple of feet, because you're, you're, as you move it forward, it's, it's, it's not uh, spreading out sideways until it gets farther up there. So it's, it's avoiding your, your wireless receiver um, antennas. So you can have them both at the same, they can both be on the same wall, but if you can, uh, if they're on mic stands or something, that it, you'll pick up a little extra performance by moving the in-ear monitor um, antenna closer to the stage. So, once you understand the polar patterns, so they're listed in everybody's spec, you can go see them. Uh, simply, it's a matter of, of taking, making that triangle, right? So you look at the 3 dB down points, you look at the center, and you create a triangle. And now you take that triangle back to your floor plan and you point it in whatever may, way makes sense for what it is you're particularly doing. Uh, obviously the shapes and sizes all change. Um, and again, if it's outdoors, that's a, good, that's a good use for an omni antenna. If you can put your antenna in the middle of things, but you can't really put your, it's hard to put your antenna in the middle of things indoors. So, with these, with these, if you follow those, the, the best practices, in other words, we don't want to lose anything that we've got. We don't want to give it away, right? We're, we have enough problems without giving any more away. So follow those best practices, stay off the walls, stay six feet up in the air, stay line of sight, don't have antenna farms. Um, that's going a long way. And then just simply create these triangles by getting that polar pattern, polar sheet from the spec sheet, ours have them, everybody's has them. Just create that, create that uh, triangle and then lay that triangle till it does what you need it to do on your floor plan. And that's basically how you aim antennas. It's, uh, it's pretty much that simple. So I guess with that, hopefully uh, we don't lose the internet again and I've run over on my time here a little bit. But uh, do we have some questions out there, Adam? Absolutely. Thanks for sticking with us, everyone. Sorry about the technical no, difficulties. It's interesting way. I have no. I have no audio from you, so I'm going to escape out of this. Stop screen sharing, and how bizarre! I have no audio. I can see you, but I have no audio coming in. Are they? Um, Questions on the chat line? Yes, yeah, so you can hit. Well, I guess hit. I'll just have to do the chat line. Q and A, Don. Q and A. Um, hit the Q and A button. Can you hear me, buddy? <laughs> okay. Thanks for the. I appreciate it. Basic question, but in ear antenna behind WL mic antenna antenna. All right. First thing is, <laughs> we generally refer to antenna as things that are on bug bugs and antennas with an S. <laughs> as a plural, but um, antenna behind WL, my, what is WL? I guess maybe that one got answered, so Rob's gonna answer it. Much of a difference, ah, okay, here's a good question. Is there much of a difference between 50 ohm coax type 
in terms of signal loss over long distances? Uh, is there a max distance for coax cable runs from antenna to receiver? That's a good one because if you go back to the performance calculator, it's going to tell you, and there's different cables that you can select. But the basic rule of thumb is the bigger the antenna is in diameter, excuse me, the coax is in diameter, the less loss it has. And that it's 100% shielded, the less loss it has, right? So most, most coax that we've used for the last, since the, in, uh, the invention of coax, is only partially shielded, around 90%. So if you were doing, um, if you were running water through pipes doing plumbing, you don't want to lose 10% of your water out of that pipe before it gets to the other end, right? So there's loss. And of course, also then you get the ability to absorb outside RF and, and interference in that cable. So uh, you want to you want to use 100% shielded coax. Uh, it costs a little more, but you know, at, at 10 bucks a cable, it's not a good place to try to save 10 bucks. Um, so yeah, use 100% shielded cable. And uh, so the, the small cable that we normally use, RG8X, uh, I rarely have any problem up to 50 feet with that. I usually don't have much problem up to 100 feet with that. Um, and then beyond 100 feet, I would go up a grade to something like Belden 9913, or LMR 400, they're basically the same wire from two different manufacturers. And simply it has half as much loss, so you can go twice as far. So you can go up to about 200 feet with that. Beyond that starts getting tricky. Uh, yes, you can use a line amplifier to bring the signal back up, but it, it ruins your dynamic range. So you may end up with a strong signal, but a strong useless signal. So. Uh, if you have to go way beyond that, if you need to go beyond 300 feet, uh, then it's time to get into RF over fiber. And with RF over fiber, you can go, you know, miles. Uh, there's just no loss in the fiber. So, yes, bigger, bigger wire goes farther. But again, the answer is uh, let's just use, uh, let's use the performance calculator and it's going to tell you. Uh, if you have a pair of paddles for receivers, is it a problem if they're on either side of the stage pointing towards the center? Um, probably not, uh, assuming, you know, you don't have too much distance. That would be fine. However, you're going to have to get, so if you're not using in-ear monitors and you can have them on both sides, yes, that would be fine. Um, but you're going to have to, now you're going to have to come in probably at 90 degrees with an in-ear antenna if you're if you're using that if you're not then you don't have to worry about it so much uh, if they're 100 or 200 megahertz apart would they still interact looking at each other i assume you're talking about antennas and yes they will uh, the farther they're apart you know that um the better right but um at 200 megahertz apart uh, you know that would you that would use the whole that would use the whole spectrum in the United States practically. You can go from 470 to 608, so you've only got a little more than 200. So, if you had one all the way at the top and all the way at the bottom, you know, it's better to spread them by distance uh, in the tuning, but it's better to to physically space them. So. Is RG8, I think we just answered this one, RG8 coax, RG8U uh, for runs of 300 foot or less. RG8U is an old style, non 100% shielded cable. So if you were going to use RG8U, um, what you want to use is Belden 9913, which is an RG8 variant. It's 100% shielded, RG8 is what it is. Or uh, Times Microwave LMR 400. Um, if you're in the professional business of live shows and you rent stuff from all over the place, LMR 400 is kind of the standard of the entertainment industry. It's basically the exactly same wire, but that's what you're going to get if you have to go out and rent it. Can you, uh, this is 
a little bit off topic, but hey, it's all about wireless. Can you speak about needing two antennas for true diversity? The mics need two antennas, but what is the best practice for permanent installation with paddles? Is it okay to use two antennas to increase range or they need to be together for diversity? Okay, so in a perfect world, we'd like to not use diversity because every time it switches back and forth, one receiver has to turn off. There's a small fraction of time and then the other receiver turns on. So it creates some kind of artifacts. Um, you don't really need diversity too much if you don't have reflections. If it's just a straight shot and you're in line of sight, then it's going to stay on that antenna. The trouble is when you go indoors, you get lots of reflections. Uh, they're uh, and so that's a problem to polarization. It gets called multipath. And Bell Labs did a lot of uh, high level testing on this years ago. And they discovered that even if you hold your mic uh, vertically, that um, indoors, where you're bouncing off the walls and the ceiling and the floor and any piece of metal that's around you, um, about 25% of your signal is, is flipping in polarization. So, so people think, how do you best practice? Some people think you can, you know, you can twist the antennas uh, into a 90 degree angle and that helps. That will cut that, will cut that 25% about in half. Now you have about 12 and a half percent of your signal that's going to cause polarization issues. Um, the only way you can solve that problem is to co-locate those two antennas, which takes a little bit of doing. You can't take too sure, uh, excuse me, I didn't say that, anybody's. You can't take anybody's paddle antennas and fix two of them exactly together so they're at the co-located spot because there's some, I mean, without re-engineering the engineer, that's what the DFIN does. It puts two antennas at the same time because um, if you have two antennas spaced in a room, the, the polarization of the wave is not going to be the same in each antenna. They're independent, so uh, they're not going to see the same wave. So who knows what wave they're going to see? So it won't. It it will improve uh, the issue, but it won't solve it. Co-located antennas is the only way to really solve that issue. Uh, should polar should transmitting and receiving antennas be parallel to each other? Um, Well, it depends. It, it doesn't matter what they are together. It matters that the transmitter and receiver um, are the same. So I, I'm sorry, I guess maybe I'm misunderstanding. If you mean by putting the transmitting antenna for IEMs parallel to the receiving antenna for your wireless mics, um, the answer is probably it, it always works out that, yeah, that's what you should do. But if you're talking about if you're talking about your handheld microphone and you're talking about one whip antenna on the back of your receiver, uh, yeah, if they're both pointed from 12 o'clock to six o'clock, that would be the maximum uh, that you're ever gonna get discounting for multipath. So that's the way our television works. That's the way the FM radio in your car works. They assume that your car is gonna be flat on four wheels and that the antenna that's on top of the mountain is not going to move, right? So we've locked that down. But, you know, that's why people want wireless mics, so they can move around. And so you can't count on them staying. Um, please explain which situations you would use uh, high and low RF power on wireless mics. Well, you always want to use the lowest power that works, right? I can't say what that number is. Um, but you want to use the lowest power that works because power interferes with all other radios, right? So if I have a couple of high power microphones in the room, they are, they, there's more crosstalk between them than if they're low power. Uh, so we always want to use the lowest amount of power uh, that we can. However, if I've got to pick up somebody on the other end of a football field, that's probably not going to work. But if you're just picking up somebody on a stage that's 30, 40, 50, 60 feet away, um, I would I always try lowest power first. Um, 
So that, but it, it depends on the situation, but it's preferable uh, because you're, 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 you will have less intermodulation distortion. There's a whole bunch of problems that are directly related to power. So the less power there is, um, the lower, the lower uh, number of these problems you're gonna have. Can you clarify target orientation of whips on the RF and you diversity fin? Does it ever change from perpendicular to the paddle? So the whips are intended to be perpendicular. So they go from nine o'clock to three o'clock. Um, every once in a while, somebody asks me if they should bend it up and the answer is no. Keep, keep them there so you have a cross. Um, uh, and that and that is what eliminates your your um, likelihood of of polarization crossfades when you have two different orientation the the radio wave is always radio wave is always uh, an electrical signal and a magnetic signal and they are always at ninety degree angles to each other that never change you know so you gotta you gotta cross how that comes in your room depends on the walls and things. But the relationship of, of the magnetic to the electrical signal is always 90 degrees. So by having the antennas always at 90 degrees, you ensure that you never lose both signals. You are always going to get one or the other. When, when, you, when you splay, you can't make that, uh, that guarantee. So loudspeakers playing two very different sine waves at each other. Exhibit no phase calculation. So, uh, let's see. So, well, you've got harmonics to deal with. Can you explain how in airs at one frequency and wireless mics at another frequency uh, interact? So, yes, I can. So, that's what's called intermodulation. And if you take two microphones, I got a great slide for that, but I guess I can't get it up. If you take two microphones, two handheld microphones, and you get them together and you've got a scanner. So for everybody with a scanner, this is real easy to see. You, you, you hold those two microphones, let's say, you know, a foot apart, two feet apart. If you go look on your scanner, you will now see four peaks. You'll see four transmitters. You've only have two. You have created, um, you have created two more. And so you'll actually measure four. And by the time you get, so if you add one more microphone to that, you're not adding one to two, you're now adding one to four. Now you got 12, you add one more. It's, this grows enormously fast that by the time you get to eight uh, transmitters, you, you actually have 40,000 possible intermods. Now it depends physically where they are on stage and it depends how powerful they are. But as somebody walks side to side on a stage, those intermods are coming up and going down. So two things happen. They're raising your noise floor, and they are spots that you probably can't tune to anymore because they're now filled with a phantom radio station. It's just noise, but it's there. So you can't, you have direct competition for, for that being an empty slot to tune your mic to. Uh, RF spotlight pads. We didn't talk about RF spotlight antenna. RF spotlight antenna is a unique antenna that is a limited range uh, antenna. Uh, one pad under stage and one pad paddle off stage or something. So the answer is that might work um, if you have a very short distance, like 10 or 15 feet, you probably can get away with the second antenna being a whip or something, they, they do that when they like interview mo movie stars, they put them in a hotel, they put two people in a chair with a table and a flower on it and nobody moves. You might get away with it with that, but the problem is if you were just doing it on a stage, for example, the spotlight is going to give you many more open frequencies to tune to. Should you then get in a position where you're going to switch from the A antenna to the B antenna, the B antenna being a regular antenna probably is going to lose a lot of those open spots. So you run the risk that when you switch to the B antenna, that the frequency you're tuned to may not work on it. Can I run RG8X cables next to the other cable? Uh, 
So it's generally a good practice not to run cables next to each other. RG8X is 100% shielded. Uh, however, I don't like to lash them together. Um, especially especially um, with digital uh, wireless microphones going through it. The power of digital wireless microphones is whatever it says it is, 10 milliwatts, 50, whatever it is, the power is, is that. But the, the duty cycle, the amount of power that's on, there's much more power coming down that wire. So the more power coming down the wire, the more chance for it to leak out. Uh, so 100% shielded cables, uh, coax cables is definitely a better idea if you're using uh, digital type wireless microphones. It's not that the RF is different. The RF is RF. I mean, there's only one kind of RF. So we don't make a distinction as far as antennas go between uh, a, digital, a digital signal and an analog signal. They are both analog, but the, 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 the modulation scheme is digital. So in the way that if you had a PA system and you have a microphone and I get up and talk into it, I talk into it, the sound comes out, everybody hears me, that's all good. If the next guy behind me speaks a different language than I do, we don't have to change the microphone out to him with how whatever language he's speaking in comes out. Now, you may have to change the receiver if you can't understand that language. That's a, not a problem of the system. That's a problem that you can't understand the language. So you're not gonna get an analog wireless mic to work with a digital receiver or the other way around. But transmitting it through the air, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, permanent installed um, antennas outdoors. Uh, probably need to be weatherized. It depends where you are in the country. If you're in a spot where you get hail, lots of snow, that kind of thing, you can actually physically break the antenna. The antennas themselves aren't terribly uh, concerned about, uh, about weather. Uh, you would probably get corrosion in the connectors, so you can, I would, I would always uh, wrap them. I use that fusible uh, heat shrink tape um and that's uh that's a good thing to do but yeah you need to provide some kind of a cover preferably plastic um uh, because that's got the, the least uh loss through it i mean you could use wood wood's got a little bit of loss depends how wet the wood is you'll get more loss when it's wet and actually i there's the thing antennas never anybody's antenna in any situation doesn't work as well wet as it would if it were dry. So, um, you know, if you've got enough, you've got enough dynamic range, I don't worry about it too much. I mean, you know, back in the old days, I used to just put trash bags over, over antennas for, you know, portable shows where not permanent install, but it's only gonna be there for a few hours. You know, green trash bags work good. But uh, anyway. So yes, you will have to come up with some kind of an option. You can mount them. If you can mount them under an eave or something, that's probably enough to physically protect it. Then you just need to protect the, the BNC connectors. And uh, you know, how, what, what's your expectation for, for the lifespan of that? You know, is five, seven, 10 years reasonable to expect? I mean, I've got, I've got antennas that are outdoors at, uh, uh, oh dear, help me. The theme park, the Universal Studios in uh, Burbank. And we don't get rain and hail in Burbank. So they've been outdoors now for eight or nine years and uh, uh, they're just fine. Uh, they get sunshine, but uh, as, long as, as long as the BNCs are, are clean, we're good. How does the Distro 9 allow for more clear channels than just cascading my receivers into a DFIN. Um, well, it depends how you're cascading. Oh, you mean you have a receiver that has a dedicated cascade output. If you have a receiver that has a dedicated cascade output, um, you are getting a little loss out of that output. So you're, you're losing a generation. And then if you cascade a third one, you've got two generations of loss. So it's kind of like, uh, for those of us old enough to remember making a cassette copy of a cassette, you just keep losing quality. So um, 
then more clear channels would be um, more would depend on the amount of inner mod that you get. Uh, a distro nine is particularly uh, uh, well equipped to handle signal. Um, everything RF active electronics are notoriously nonlinear. That means they behave as compressors. You know, so if you're doing audio recording, you know what a compressor does to your sound. It fattens it by taking all the edge out of it. Um, the same thing happens with your radio signal. So however they've done that cascading in their receiver, I couldn't tell you. I assume some people do it better than others. But it is a, it is going to cause you uh, a little bit of loss. And the more you cascade, the more loss you're going to get. So usually, I mean, we don't get to one problem that takes us off the air. We're always dealing with the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, and so the problem is when you get too many straws, it doesn't really matter which straw is too many. It just matters that you're over the threshold. So we want to remove straws. So using a distro nine uh, HDR is high dynamic range and it simply has more dynamic range than anybody's anything that I've ever seen. And, uh, Therefore, um, it doesn't create as much inner mod. What happened here? Can I run our, uh, let's see, we have advisable to make an antenna stand out of plastic like PVC pipe or metal stand. Well, so yes, it would. It's not very practical. And if you could, you know, if, if it were, if it were as, as rugged, as strong, uh, then sure, make it out of plastic. However, um, remember that on your metal mic stand where that bolts into your antenna, that's on the relatively dead side of your antenna. So it doesn't make as much difference there as it would if it were behind your antenna. Uh, you would have more loss there. You know, we're never going to make any of these things perfect unless we're in controlled conditions like a Faraday, a Faraday cage. Um, and, uh, so, you know, in lab conditions, we can, we can make some of these things where they make a difference, but out in the real world, you're pretty much probably gonna, you're never going to get it perfect. So we're always trying to make it, uh, the least objectionable that we can and remove some of those straws off the camel's back. So I think, uh, Adam, I can't see anybody and I can't hear anybody. Can you hear me? We, we've gone way past our time, haven't we? <laughs> I don't, so have to do I'm not sure, not sure if Don has the audio. Yeah, here this is really fun. weird, guys. Um, <laughs> thanks for putting up. Thanks for putting up with all the. Uh, uh, hey, this is what happens in uh, you know live. No, no retakes. No, uh, no overdubs. We're live, and you know, uh, better here now with friends than in the middle of the show, right? Right. Absolutely. When your wireless mics drop out in the middle of the show, that's not nearly as comfortable as this was. So with that, uh, I'm going to sign off. I'll turn it back over to Adam. As always, um, you can reach me at, uh, I'm just Don, D-O-N, at RF venue. Uh, or you can talk to Adam. Any of those guys would be happy to help. Um, my information is online at our, at our tech support. And that is my cell phone number that's listed on tech support. I'm in California. Don't call me at five in the morning if you're someplace else. But uh, you're welcome to call me anytime and just ask direct questions. So with that, I'm going to sign off, Adam, and say thank you all for, for showing up today. And I hope, uh, hope we made your day a little bit better working with wireless mics in the future. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Dawn. Hopefully you can hear me, but maybe not. Anyway, I uh, appreciate everyone's time for coming into this webinar. I hope it was productive for you. We uh, are going to follow up with you to see if there's any questions from the webinar that we can answer later. We can email you directly or you just, you know, certainly email us directly, adam at rfnu.com and rob at rfnu.com as well. If you have a question for Don, uh, Don, D-O-N at rfnu.com and we'll be happy to take the time to answer any questions that we missed. We tried to answer everyone's questions and hopefully the extended question and answer section made up for a little bit of technical difficulties that, that we had. So um, thanks again. We look forward to seeing you on the next one and uh, I hope you have a great rest of the week and enjoy your day. Bye folks. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Adam. Cheers. Take care.